I feel sorry for younger gamers today. Gaming revolutions don't happen very often. I saw two in as many years. If Super Mario 64 was the game that beckoned a new dawn of video games, then The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time was a supernova. It's still the highest ranked game on Metacritic, still tops ranking lists. It's been ported, remastered and remade, and people still want more. Even when Breath of the Wild hit its apex, there were those still saying, Yeah, it's good, but it's not Ocarina of Time good. But I almost didn't play it. Back in 1998, just before Christmas, I had a choice to make. I trekked down to the local game shop to purchase Banjo-Kazooie, the game I'd been desperate to play since its release in the summer. I was there, Gandalf. I was there 3,000 years ago. When I finally got to the N64 section, I noticed a new release, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. I say new release, all they had left was a single, dog-eared, second-hand copy. I had no idea a Zelda game was even in development, let alone released. All I knew is that I'd loved A Link to the Past, thoroughly enjoyed Zelda 2, and had accidentally broken Zelda 1. Feeling strangely drawn to the understate of black and gold box art, as it was in the UK, I took a chance on Ocarina of Time. There was one last problem to overcome, however. He had to wait until Christmas Day to play it. When the big day finally arrived, I booted up the game. Dumbstruck is the right word. <laughs> Nearly the right word. There were no other adjectives capable of relaying what I was seeing. It was a sensory overload and it came from all directions. Firstly, the opening cutscene burned into my mind. The lightning cracks, Zelda fleeing on horseback, Link's shocked expression, Navi's sweeping journey. Secondly, when I finally took control, the clever use of pre-rendered backgrounds looked absolutely phenomenal for the time. <laughs> I can think of a couple of adjectives I'd use to describe them now. Don't start. And thirdly, history records that Ocarina of Time's Z targeting system was in itself a mini-revolution, a creative way to always focus on selected enemies while you get busy slicing them to bits. But it didn't feel like that at the time. It was so natural and intuitive, it didn't even register as a new mechanic. It was just perfect, like it had always been there. All of this was great, but if I thought my mind had been blown so far... No, not yet! Oh, we're doing the meme thing now, are we? After leaving Kokiri Forest, you're shown a small cutscene showing Hyrule Field in all its glory. While you obviously see the field during the opening credits of the game, being able to finally walk around it was overwhelming. Ocarina of Time had been hitting me with revelation after revelation, and with my head still spinning over the sheer size of Hyrule Field, I noticed something odd. This draw distance? The colour palette was darkening. What was happening? Was something wrong? And then it clicked. The sun was setting. I'd never seen the dynamic time of day change in a video game before. I don't think it was the first game to have a day-night cycle like this, but to experience it in a fully believable 3D world was really something else. I wish it was something else. What's wrong with you? I hate gushing, all right. A massive grin on my face. I made my way to the castle and spotted the drawbridge being raised. Just as I got to the entrance, it was fully upright. Well, now what? You don't get many gaming experiences like this anymore. Even if you do encounter a what am I supposed to do now moment, you know there's always someone online to help you out. In 1998, you were on your own. And so was Link. Undead monsters began to pop up all around me. Looking back, this all seems quite harmless. But as a kid at the time, this was intense. I had no idea how long I was going to have to wait until dawn, where I assumed the drawbridge was going to lower again. By this point, I was almost punch drunk from all the mind-blowing things I'd experienced. But yet again, I never expected what awaited me through the castle gates. In 2012, Shigeru Miyamoto had an interview with GameCult, where he revealed the Link's name comes from the fact that in the original Legend of Zelda, the Triforce pieces you set out to assemble were going to be electronic chips of sorts. The game was to be set in both the past and the future, and Link would be the literal link between them. Now whether or not he was messing around, or it's just some dodgy translation, Link linking things is pretty established. In the famous and infamous Hyrule Historia, Miyamoto's introduction states that Link is called Link because he links people together, meaning he links the player with the game world and the inhabitants of the game with each other. Hmm. Now 
what's wrong? No, no, you carry on talking to all your friends. I'll just sit here. Link is a child that awoke one morning to discover that his life would never be the same again. Everything he thought he knew was about to change. We discover this new world alongside him. As established as Link is, as a Nintendo character, he was always intended to be an avatar of sorts to the player in control of him. Hence why you input a name of your choosing in many Zelda games and also why Link remains mostly silent throughout them. The idea that you are Link is never more apparent than in Ocarina of Time. As we discussed in our previous video about Super Mario 64, gaming in a 3D space allows players to move through the world in a manner that mirrors how humans map the real world. While Super Mario 64 had story elements, the game was little more than a series of challenges and geometric obstacles for Mario to navigate. Ocarina of Time really made you feel like the hero starting out on a great adventure becoming stronger and more capable on the way. It was every kid's fantasy finally made real. A word of advice, content creator boy. Don't take one of the most beloved video games ever created and say that it's little more than a series of challenges and geometric obstacles, unless you want the online equivalent of death by a thousand cuts. I felt a constant pull, like I simply had to move forward through the game. And just when I thought I had it all figured out, there was a twist or some new introduction of a mechanic, an item, an upgrade or a story revelation that kept me pushing. Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom are phenomenal games, but one thing, among others, that I find missing is the feeling of how far you've come. When Link returns to Kokiri Forest as an adult in Ocarina of Time, it's a striking moment. You're almost nostalgic for this area, even though it wasn't all that long ago you were starting out as a child. I never had this feeling revisiting Link's house in A Link to the Past, or when revisiting the Great Plateau or the Great Sky Island in Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom respectively. Some of the best games I've played in recent times are the ones that focus on progression, and I don't mean skill trees or little green numbers. I mean actual progression of knowledge either through tactics or a growing understanding of the game world around you. Some good examples are games like Sea of Thieves, the pirate adventure game which has zero character progression outside of cosmetics and titles, or Slay the Spire, the roguelike deck building game that requires deep understanding of tactics and mechanics to triumph, or Outer Wilds, a game set in a perpetual loop asking the player to unpick and learn as much as possible before experiencing the cycle all over again. Zelda games have always found a great middle ground between organic and scripted elements. What makes Link stronger isn't a number hidden in a menu you, but a hard-fought weapon or an understanding of how items behave in the world around you. But you're also given a defined sense of purpose and of what is being asked of you in the context of the story. Playing the old computer game there? <laughs> By the time I'd collected all three spiritual stones and returned to Hyrule Castle, I was totally engrossed. And after the cutscene of Link becoming an adult had played out, I knew I was witnessing a very special moment in gaming history. Ocarina of Time came at just the right time in my life. I was old enough to truly appreciate the series of technological and gameplay advancements, young enough to be swept along in the fantasy of it all. I was witnessing game developers at the very peak of their powers. I will never forget what it felt like to be Link, and I hope kids in the future will one day get to experience a step up like Ocarina of Time. Through all this gushing, he doesn't even address one glaring fact. What's that? Ocarina of Time isn't even his favourite Zelda game. It's actually... Shush! Don't tell them. We'll save that for another video. Oh, no one gives a shit about this self-indulgent nonsense, Hev. Let me tell them. Please, let me spoil it. No, tell you what. You can tell them Biffa's least favourite Zelda game. Link's crossbow training. That's not a Zelda game, that's a spin-off. <laughs> no, this is a spin-off. Whee! <laughs>